right now across the portfolio, some of our CBD districts are are struggling a bit, whereas our suburban locations are thriving, which is hilarious because, you know, it was only a few years ago when every operator, every brand out there was obsessed with first sticking their flag in a CBD type district and then growing out from there. When now we're almost seeing the exact opposite. It's almost important to hit the burbs and work your way in. And so rooftops are important, of course, you know, because we, we typically service a, a slightly younger clientele, median age is typically people in their 30s, walkability, close access to restaurants and bars, things like that are very important. As I mentioned earlier, easy accessibility, things like that, visibility is very important. And again, you know, when we're up in a tower in a downtown setting, that's a a bit more of a difficult setting for us as opposed to having kind of quasi retail presence on the first floor where we're very seen. So all those things are pretty important, but I, I would say that rooftops is becoming one of the, one of the most important things as you know, when we're, we're surrounded by rooftops, that, that location typically does really well. Hey guys, welcome back to the Fort podcast. My name is Chris Powers and I want to thank you for joining me today. This show is an open-ended discussion and journey covering real estate, business, entrepreneurship, and investing. I would love to hear from you by tweeting me at Fort Worth Chris on Twitter. And if you've enjoyed this show, I would be super grateful if you would follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you listen to. And if on Apple, it would mean a lot if you'd leave a rating and review. Last but not least, you can find all these episodes on YouTube, Thank you so much again for joining me and enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by Fort Capital. I know what you're thinking. Here goes Chris talking about Fort Capital again, but guys, it's important to me. Fort Capital is a real estate investment firm based in Fort Worth, Texas. That's why my Twitter handle is Fort Worth Chris. We have a track record of transacting more than $1.4 billion in assets throughout Texas. That's crazy to me. 17 years ago, I bought my first house for $100,000. The team over at Fort is currently looking to acquire Class B industrial deals between $10 and $75 million throughout the major markets of Texas. In fact, Fort Capital was named the fastest growing real estate company in Texas by Inc. Magazine last year. To learn more about Fort Capital, visit www.fortcapitallp.com. Nick, welcome to the show, man. I'm excited to have you. Thank you. It's good to be here. I have a lot of respect for you. Uh, we are coming out of a pandemic, and you're in an industry that had a, an interesting perspective on uh, you know, how the world was changing. So maybe let's just start uh, right in the deep end, and then I want to kind of get back to how the whole business started. But what are you seeing now in the, in the world as we kind of reemerge out of this pandemic? Are we getting back to the way things were, or are there certain things that you're seeing that um, are kind of permanent changes? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, we're definitely seeing some permanent changes. You know, companies have taken a look at how they're approaching office space. And I think the pandemic made a lot of companies, companies of all size, realize that an incredibly long-term lease mm -hmm. that they're uh, that they're in doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, the flexibility of being able to maneuver in and out of space, and and even you know now now we're looking at office space and saying, hey, it competes with the home office, right? We send everybody home for a year and a half, and people got pretty comfortable at the house, and you know to bring them out of their homes. There needs to be a great amenity set, a lot of comfortable factors, um, and a lot of flexibility. And so, you know, I think the pandemic really moved us into the future of office much faster. And and for us, for a company like Common Desk, it was very hard during 2020 and 2021 because flex office companies, flex office operators were affected really you know, they're one of the first type of companies that, that became heavily affected by the pandemic, which yeah. you know, really all hospitality enabled companies were, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, but thankfully, you know, due to the flexibility aspect, I think we're also one of the first industries to rebound 
pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, as people started venturing back out of their homes safely and coming back to work, it made a lot of sense for companies to start abandoning their longer term leases and start taking a look at a strategy where they're leveraging flex office providers like us. And, and with that adaptation, how are, um, you know, banks and capital markets kind of reacting to the shorter term lease? I mean, it, it, traditionally, it's been that long term lease that, uh, you know, get people comfortable and make them want to pay up for real estate and things of that nature. It, are banks and kind of the capital markets starting to adjust to these kind of shorter term leases by nature? You know, slowly but surely. We were out there kind of on the forefront of that, you know, back in 2016, Common Desk was one of the first operators, if not the first operator in the United States, to introduce the management agreement model between the the operator, which is Common Desk in this case, and the landlord. Um, and it was a it was a grind. It was tough to get those first few deals signed because capital markets did not understand that type of an agreement. You know, obviously we've always valued office based on future cash flow based on the commitment to future cash flow, based on credit tenant, uh, tenant's credit um, that, that's being applied to the rent roll. And, and Flex Office really, um, you know, really turns that upside down, so to speak. And, you know, I think it's why we saw Flex Office begin with large tenant occupiers, groups like WeWork and IWG signing these master leases and then playing the arbitrage game. But uh, I think landlords saw that's pretty dangerous as well over the last couple of years to where um, some of that credit that they're getting for the lease was a bit of a myth. Um, And it was creating a weird kind of bifurcated scenario within an office building where you have a tenant, especially a tenant that's providing a lot of large enterprise space that's sometimes competing with the landlord. And so, you know, as flex office goes from 2% of the market to potentially 20, 25% of the market, uh, it'd be crazy to think that it's all going to be outsourced to a tenant. Um, It's going to have to become a part of the third party operation of the building, uh, which means capital markets are going to continue to have to figure it out. We're seeing, we're seeing comps where they are. We've been a part of buildings that have traded where you know, we might only be 10 to 15 or 20 percent of the total building. But, you know, the, the capital markets are giving credit, you know, to the amount of space common desk is ocu- occupying as if we were a tenant in the project, which is nice to see. It shows that we're making progress. Can you describe what the management agreement model actually is and how it works? Absolutely. It's uh, so. First, I'll go back and you know describe you know if if you've got an occupier that's simply signing a master lease, right? They're committing to a rent payment month over month, and you know t- typically signing up for a ten to fifteen year term, especially with renewal options in place. If both the landlord and the tenant are 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 paying up to two hundred dollars a square foot in tenant improvements, right? Mm-hmm. Um, well, with the management agreement model, we're basically saying, hey. Just like the traditional space that's in your building, we're going to come in and be a third-party um, leasing and management company of sorts for your flex office operation. And so, you know, we'll come in, we'll design it for you, um, we'll do the layout, we'll we'll help with with the project management, we'll get it all the way to opening day. The capital improvements are being paid for by the landlord because the landlord actually owns the operation of the flex office space, and then we'll operate it post opening. And we typically operate it for a flat like licensing fee month over month. Um, and then we're, we're in a, a performance management fee. Typically once we're hurdling some sort of a performance hurdle, a lot of times that can be tied to a, a, a double hurdle type scenario where we're hurdling first um, triple nets and then hurdling um, you know, a gross rent equivalent. And once we get to that point, we're sharing in the gross operating profit of the operation. And so, you know, it, it creates a very aligning structure b- between the landlord and the operator uh, to where the operator is no longer competing with the landlord across different product types in the building. 
you know, if we're getting it right, we're truly working together with the landlord to help them fill the entire project, including the flex office operation. Do the rest of the tenants in the building get to benefit from the flex office operation, or is it just the people that sign up to be in a common desk? You know, it's a little bit landlord by landlord. You know, if, if we get a very progressive landlord, they realize that, hey, it's, you know, if I'm going to spend five to seven million dollars on a, a flex office operation in the building, I certainly want it to feel like an amenity to all of my tenants. Right. Um, you would think every landlord would think that way. Some, some do not. And so I think it's, you know, common desk would like to move the ball forward even more of like the installations that we're putting in these buildings, which are typically anywhere from like 20 to 50,000 square feet, Mm -hmm. um, to be viewed as a true, almost an amenity lounge, a tenant lounge for the rest of the people in the building. And like I said, that is sometimes the case that is sometimes not the case. It's one of the reasons why. Um, when you walk into a common desk, we don't have a reception desk. We have what we call a hospitality bar. And uh, that hospitality bar is powered by our coffee brand called Fiction Coffee. And we do these type of things so that it can truly be seen as an amenity of the building. We want to be able to serve like nice third wave uh, espresso based coffee drinks to the rest of the tenants in the building. And we want to pull people out of the tower into these flexible office spaces. Um, we also want tours to begin like inside of the common desk space where the leasing agents are bringing tenants through the flex office space and helping them understand that, hey, you can take 25,000 square feet up in the tower um, and you can rest assured that it will be the right amount of space for you for a 10 year term because we can parlay that with the flex office space that we have down on the first and second floors. Yep. Do y'all do best on the first and second floors or does it matter where you are in the building? Yeah, we do a little better when we're, when we're on one and two, it just, it helps with the accessibility and the visibility of the project. We find that our members or tenants are very transient and they, they're typically moving in and out of the building on a more regular basis and maybe some of the more traditional occupiers. Yep. And so, um, being on one, having a presence on one is always nice for us. Yep. Okay, well, do you have any data or if I was a landlord and you were telling me, hey, you should allow this to be an amenity to the whole building, and I said, uh, no, I, I don't. I don't want that to happen. It's it's just for your tenants. Like, what is your kind of pitch? Like, do you have any data of why buildings perform better if the whole building can participate in the common desk amenity versus just the tenants that have signed up for common desk? We have a number of cases where you know you're starting to see RFPs go out for these larger occupiers, where they're asking landlords what is their flex office solution, you know. And so I think the industry itself is starting to produce some data on that as you're starting to see occupier uh, behaviors change around flex office, and they're starting to demand it um, based on the tour list that they're putting together for new buildings they're wanting to take a look at, and yeah. so. Um, and, and, and we've seen many times where, you know, one of our landlord partners has made a deal because common desk is in the building. And so, you know, it's, uh, um, we don't have a whole lot of great data because, because our access systems are, we, we depend on landlord access systems. So our landlord, our access systems are all over the place across the portfolio. So I can't tell you exactly how many tenants are, are are coming into our spaces, tenants of the building that are coming in our spaces on the daily basis. Right. But I can tell you that tenants are now actively seeking out having a flex office operation in the buildings that they're now considering or looking at moving into. Right. And are y'all only operating off the management agreement model? Y'all are not signing leases yourselves and then it's kind of a lease arbitrage play? That is correct. We haven't signed a lease since 2016. And, um, you know, I think you know, since 2016, we would every once in a while consider signing a lease, but um, we've, we've, we've worked hard at making sure that the ind- industry sees us as a third party operator yep. as opposed to a tenant. Yep. Um, because obviously, you know, especially in 2016 to kind of the 2019 era, you know, landlords were, pretty reluctant to uh, 
<laughs> uh, to switch over to this management agreement model. Um, they really, you know, really wanted to kind of pigeonhole us as a, a tenant in the building. And I, I understand that. I understand that mainly because of the capital markets and what landlords are used to. But we were heavily convicted that at some point this would become the norm. And is that the case? Like, is are all these other companies, is it kind of a you have to adapt to the management agreement or else? Because I think the, you know, anybody that was being critical of the industry would have said, well, you know, anybody, any of these co-working spaces that have signed a, a lease and that are doing really well and profitable, the landlord's going to know their margin and that margin will be captured upon lease renewal back to the landlord. Right. Yes. It's becoming more and more norm, you know, for operators to be requesting management agreements, but you're only seeing the operators that have a really great track record um, getting these management agreements pushed across the goal line. Yep. And so you still have a, a ton of brands out there that are either signing um, kind of a, a pure lease model or some, some type of a hybrid lease um, to where, you know, it almost looks more like a retail lease where landlords are going to participate in some of the upside, but it's still, you know, it's still a lease agreement. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know if it's ever going to fully switch over to pure management agreements across the board, but I think we could all agree that it'd be very hard for, you know, class A office space to reach 20% of flex office by tenant occupiers in buildings. That's, one, that'd be a, a ton of the rent roll that the landlord is handing over to their tenants to manage. Um, and it would take probably a few more WeWorks in the room to uh, mm -hmm. um, to open that amount of space over the next 10 years or so. Okay, so just so I understand this correctly, you go to a landlord, they decide to make a deal. They say, Nick, we're going to give you 50,000 feet. And here's seven million dollars to build it out. Uh, that's on their dime. We're going to build it out. We're going to buy all the furniture. Everything's going to be spec the way you want it. And then Common Desk is going to come in and operate this thing beautifully, so that you know new tenants will arrive and occupy the space and really enjoy it and become you know a fixture in the building. That is correct. And, and and the landlord's paying for the build out, the furniture is does common desk provide them all the specs and the planning and y'all say, you know, this is how we would do it. Is that kind of y'all's like it has to be to kind of y'all spec, even though they're paying for it? We do. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're careful with that. We want it to feel like a partnership. It is a partnership. Right. So, um, you know, one thing common desk does is we do not we do not have our design standards so rigid to where we're basically printing the same common desk over and over again. Our process with that is saying, hey, we want to meet with a landlord and we want to, one, make sure that whatever design or installation that we're placing into the landlord's building is a fit for that project. You know, and so an example of that, if we're going into a old brick and mortar 1880 vintage building, we're going to build it a certain way that feels like it's a fit for that building, as opposed to if we're going into a class double A million square foot trophy asset in a downtown submarket, that's going to get a bit of a different installation. And, you know, the other thing we're always looking out for, for our landlord partners is uh, really just doing just enough so that the space can perform really well. Right. You know, and I think that means getting kind of the brand ego out of the room. <laughs> Yeah. a bit and saying, Hey, I mean, obviously every time I'd love to design a Taj Mahal of co-working spaces, <laughs> but let's, let's make sure that we're doing exactly what needs to be done for the space to perform really well. Um, and that's, that's a lot, that approach has allowed us to really work hard at value engineering every step along the way and being, being able to brag a bit of, you know, having one of the lowest, not the lowest build out costs in the game when it comes to, you know, standing up new installations. And to confirm what, um, like what services are y'all providing? You know, I think at one point I read that y'all might've owned the actual coffee business that is providing coffee, but are y'all, do y'all own other businesses? Or are you just partnering with other businesses? What all are you providing within the space? 
it is basically a turnkey operation for what is being provided within the space. So, okay. you know, we are we are staffing the space with typically two to three staff members. Uh, those are common desk staff members that are reimbursed by the landlord. The landlord reimburses our operating expenses. Um, yes, we do have a coffee brand called Fiction Coffee that's typically kind of integrated into the co-working build-out plus installation. And so uh, Fiction Coffee is being broadcast and, and served throughout the space. Um, and then, of course, we have all of the amenities that we're managing. We have a back-end sales and marketing team that's making sure that the leads are coming through um, and that we are closing on those leads. Um, and then all of the back-end support that is needed to make sure that we are delivering to the landlord a very turnkey holistic package. Okay. So, you know, I think most people think about co-working spaces and they think about maybe, you know, the, the independent worker that shows up, but, and we'll talk about the whole, we work, you know, the latest thing that you've done with, we work and, and their enterprise sales, but what are you, are you seeing that a lot larger companies are starting to show up into this space going, look, we're not professional office operators. You know, we need, you know, Nick common desk has 50,000 feet. We need 20,000 of it. And we're willing to pay the extra money for you to just service it beautifully so that we can just show up to work and do what we do best and live in a really cool space without having to, you know, possibly have all these employees on staff that make the office uh, a really cool place to be. We'll just let you be that staff for us. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's crazy to see how the customer within the flex office industry has evolved over the last 10 years. If you go all the way back to kind of the inception of co-working, which would be like the late aughts, early 2010s, um, it was mainly, you know, your startups, your freelancers, the kind of the gig economy uh, that was walking into these co-working spaces. And, you know, you, you're typically signing up members one person at a time, right? Which was a slug. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh uh, it was a fun slug. I, I enjoyed those days because, you know, it's a very different type of customer and um, a very personal business. And it's why, you know, community is typically such a uh, a value of each one of these different co-working spaces because it was very important to build community with these individuals that were walking in the door because that was one of the things they were missing, right? There was no work culture for them. They didn't have a team. And so... They're walking into co-working spaces, expecting the co-working space itself to become their team. And those are fun days. You know, and then as we kind of, as we got into 2013, 14, 15, you start to see co-working operators build out all of these private offices, right? And you're like, wait a minute, I thought this is like a big open shared space. And I'm walking in, I'm seeing a skew mix of a ton of one to 12 person offices. And that's really when co-working started to apply itself to the SMBs of the world and and started taking business away from the Regis's out there, you know, and 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 servicing the SMBs well. And then as as we moved past 2015, you really started enterprise, you know, you really started seeing enterprise companies um, begin to utilize co-working spaces. And and that's when when I would say is really when co-working evolved into this flex office operation where, you know, the enterprise users of all size decided, hey, like there is value in a fully turnkey solution where, you know, we can get these leases off of our balance sheet. We can kind of maneuver in and out of space much easier. Yep. Um, and, and obviously we've seen like we work. You know, over 50% of their business are these big enterprise teams that accessing their space. Some of them, you know, multiple floors of an office building at a time. You know, and there's other brands like Commodus where we, we've, we've stuck to, you know, mainly the SMBs and, and these smaller teams because <laughs> there's not as much vacancy risk when, you know, two to eight people leave at a time as opposed to 400 people. Yeah walking out the door at one time. Um, and, you know, I think it's just the, the sector of the business, the part of the business that, that we really enjoy. And being that we partner with landlords, we've, we've come up with some new creative ways and how we're standing up enterprise space yep. for, for these landlord partners, which we can speak to in a minute. Yep. 
not to not to ask you to spill your secret sauce, but uh, what are the the key things that come to mind? If somebody asks you, what do you need in a location? What makes a successful common desk location? What are the uh, demographics of the area or the building or, um, you know, what needs to add up for you to go? This would be a great place to have a common desk. That's evolved a a good bit as well uh, over the last few years. You know, I think especially with within the common desk universe, since we primarily focus on SMBs um, and these 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 smaller SKU mixes you know, really surrounding rooftops, <laughs> like, and yeah, uh, that, that's very important to us. So it almost kind of bends like the rules of, of typical office locations, you know, like for example, right now across the portfolio, some of our CBD districts are, are struggling a bit, whereas our suburban locations are thriving, um, which is hilarious because, you know, it was only a few years ago when every operator, every brand out there was obsessed with first sticking their flag in a CBD type district and then growing out from there. When now we're almost seeing the exact opposite. It's almost important to hit the burbs and work your way in. Um, and so rooftops are important, of course, you know, because we we typically service a a slightly younger clientele, um, you know, median age is typically people in their thirties, walkability, you know, close access to restaurants and bars, things like that are very important. And then I, as I mentioned earlier, easy ingress, egress, easy accessibility, things like that. Visibility is very important. And again, you know, when we're up in a tower in a downtown setting, that's a, a bit more of a difficult setting for us as opposed to having kind of quasi retail presence on the first floor um, where we're very seen. Um, so all those things are pretty important, but I, I would say that rooftops is becoming one of the, one of the most important things as, you know, when we're, we're surrounded by rooftops, that, that location typically does really well. Let's take a quick break to highlight this episode's sponsor, Juniper Square. If you aren't familiar with Juniper Square, it's an easy to use all-in-one investment management software designed specifically for real estate owners. We have been using it at Fort Capital for several years now, and it has completely revamped the experience we're able to provide our investors through reporting, management, and efficiency. Here's Brandon Sedloff, Managing Director at Juniper Square, explaining more about their platform. When we started to look under the hood of these real estate investment managers, that were telling us about their problems, one of the things that we identified was that kind of the operating system of record for managing a lot of the most important information was still spreadsheets. They have never been designed to be a system of record, right? And and when we when we started looking at kind of why real estate reporting was the way that it was, what we found is that spreadsheets were being used as a system of record. Of record. And the problem that that created was it makes it really hard to take this information, get the information out of spreadsheets and get it into the hands of the people who need it the most, which are your investors. You can check out episode 37 to listen to my full conversation with Brandon or visit cjunipersquare.com for more information. That's S-E-E juniperquare.com. Are you interested in investing in commercial real estate but don't know where to start? Lex has created a new way for you to invest in real estate. Lex turns individual buildings into public stocks via IPO. Each building gets a ticker and trades like your other stocks. Now you can invest, trade, and manage your own portfolio of high quality commercial real estate. Any U.S. investor can open a Lex account, browse opportunities in various asset classes, such as multifamily and office buildings, and buy shares of those individual buildings. Lex opens up direct and tax advantage ownership in an asset class that has been previously inaccessible to most investors. Start investing in commercial real estate today by exploring Lex's live assets in New York City and upcoming IPOs across the country. Sign up for free at lex-markets.com backslash fort and get up to $500 in deposit bonuses when you fund your account. Again, that's lex, L-E-X, dash markets.com backslash fort. And now back to the show. You just announced recently that you uh, you kind of did something big. You, I think you sold your business to WeWork. Is that a fair assessment? 
That's a fair assessment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's just start with um, how did that all kind of start materializing? Um, has that been in the works for a long time? Was it a goal or kind of what happened there? Yeah, you know, it was never a goal. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of startups out there where, I mean, they, they truly begin with the end in mind of saying, hey, we're, we're building this to be acquired. Um, that was never the goal of Common Desk. But you know, as, as we've, you know, we're 10 years old now. We started in 2012. And I mean, there are thousands of co-working brands out there, right? And I think, you know, we're, we're certainly going to see a massive consolidation over the next few years because there is no need for thousands of brands <laughs> out there. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be a number of them that prevail. And, um, you know, Common Desk, as we we're going into the pandemic, actually, we had a signed term sheet for an investment round uh, right at the very end of February of 2020. Oh, wow. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, we needed that investment round <laughs> <laughs> um, because we were growing uh, significantly at that time. In February of 2020, we had our our best month that we'd ever had as a company. The management agreement was starting to become way more accepted with these landlord partners. P pitches are never easy, right? But they were getting easier, meaning we were opening more at a time and we were needing a much bigger support staff um, to handle all of the new openings. And so we had, we, we had signed a term sheet. And then, of course, we all know what happened in March of 2020. COVID hit and um, these investors were basically like, hey, <laughs> We're going to push pause on 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 this investment. We'll yeah. circle back once COVID is over. And <laughs> once again, if you think back, it wasn't that long ago, two years ago, we all thought COVID might be over in a couple of months. Not that big of a deal. Um, and here we are in 2022, still somewhat dealing with it. Yep. Um, and so, you know, it uh, it put a lot of pressure on the business. And um, I honestly look back at 2020, and I'm still surprised we made it through it. Uh, because our business did, did get hit incredibly hard during those first few months. I mean, you know, we, we are now moving towards, and I think all of Flex Office is moving to, towards longer term agreements. Um, but we still have a ton of month to month business. And all of that month to month business went right out the door, right? Um, and it basically knocked us out of the promote at every single location meaning that we were surviving off of licensing fees, which, you know, there's probably some other operators out there thinking, oh, we still had to pay rent. Um, so at least we didn't, you know, at least we uh, we did have a, a model that kind of allowed us to survive in that in that mode and 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 get through that time period. But um, it certainly meant that we we were still in need of, you know, some sort of an investment or operating partner. Um, and so we, we made it through thankful, you know, thankful for some of those PPP and EIDL loans. Uh, we got it through 2020 and, and, and as we were entering into 2021, we started exploring all the options and I was you know, paying very close attention to WeWork story. You know, they hired a, a new CEO as of the very beginning of 2020. I liked the focus that was back in the room for the company, um, I felt like they were doing a number of, of things very correctly and very right. Um, and I loved I loved the fact that they had a really a war machine when it came to going out and finding and securing enterprise clients, which is a big part that is missing for Common Desk because we've never heavily focused on that. Like I said earlier, you know, we've we've stayed focused on what we believe is core for us, which is really those S and Bs yep. out there. And so um kind of mid-2021, I made a connection with Sandeep, the new CEO of, of WeWork. I say new, he's been there for two years now. And we hit it off. Um, we really enjoyed each other, and we really felt like the two brands complemented each other well. There's things that Common Desk was doing, like the management agreement, like the focus on Southern hospitality and, and really the experiences in the spaces that you know, through all the growth and the growth at all cost that we worked, it felt like they were needing a bit more of, and it, it felt like a nice marriage. And so, 
Yeah. So as of August of last year, we were on a track of trying to figure out what that might look like. And, and as of two days ago, I am now officially a WeWork employee, <laughs> uh, which feels good. Um, so Common Desk is now known as Common Desk, a WeWork company. And we're not, we're not fully rebranding to WeWork. Um, we're going to run the brands on kind of separate parallels. Mm-hmm. You know, I think Common Desk is going to continue focusing on those 20 to 40,000 square foot installations that focuses on the customer that, that we're servicing. And WeWork is, is, you know, continuing to open these, you know, 50,000 square foot plus flex office operations that have a heavy focus on enterprise. So, um, is there overlap between the two brands? Absolutely, but not near as much overlap as as what we have with some of our other competitors out there. And so we're we're looking forward to it. I mean, we're we're just getting going. We still have a lot to figure out from an integration standpoint, but I think it's going to be great. The, the capital need kind of goes away. It gives you all a a pathway to open up a lot more locations, kind of under the Common Desk brand. Yeah, you know, I think. And one thing that we want to make sure landlords understand from us is that we've always been very focused and methodical with how we grow. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing we absolutely, we have no desire of doing is just blowing the lid off of the thing. Right. And neither we work doesn't want us to do that as well. And so that's you know, something I appreciated from their executive team is they really let us define the pace of growth over the next couple of years. Yep. Um, you know, we've been on this pace of really getting to like one new opening a month, which might sound like a, a, a ton. I don't know. But, you know, we've been doing it for 10 years and we've got a, a nice group behind it where we feel like we can get to that level and still have a very focused approach. But anything beyond that starts to starts to feel like we can no longer, you know, have each new common desk location feel very different from the other. Yep. You know, it, it gets to a point where you have to over standardize. And I think based on the fact that we sign these landlord partnerships, that could become dangerous. And I was very appreciative of, of kind of the new WeWork that recognizes that and understands that, you know, Common Desk needs to be able to define their growth strategy um, so that we can keep the magic in the room of what we've created over the first 10 years. You, you said something that uh, piqued my interest. How, how long does it actually take? to open one up from the day that you, let's say you've, you know, you kind of done the site tour, you like the, the deal and you start talking with the landlord from the the day that you decide it's a great location to the day it opens. What's the typical turnaround there? A year, six months, a quarter? Well, it usually takes about four months to build, build one out. Right. And Mm -hmm. another few months to negotiate the agreement and another few months to, design a location and so best case scenario if we are moving with with no speed bumps you're looking at eight or nine months um you know worst case scenario if we get caught in a vicious value engineering exercise during during the uh the bidding process you know that can go beyond a year going back to kind of where we started the conversation uh on you know, just kind of like the way things have changed. If you had to make like a a prediction, I'm not asking you to be a fortune teller, but you're going to have kind of these first, um, first views and data points of kind of human, you know, how humans will settle kind of post COVID things are just kind of this feeling that, okay, I think we're kind of past it. It's kind of over. Do you think that, that, these really are structural fundamental changes in the way people office, or do you think we'll start hearing a lot of these companies and CEOs saying uh, the two year hiatus is over and we're all going to start marching back in. And maybe the answer is they're going to march back into a, a, a flexible workspace rather than a traditional. But is it fair to say from your point of view that they're starting to come back or is it yet to be determined? Like what's your gut telling you? My gut tells me people are desperate to come back. Yeah. People are wanting to come back. Yep. You know, I, I myself enjoyed being at home for a little bit. Um, yeah. It was, it was kind of, there was like a novelty with it and it was, it was fun for a couple of months. 
um, running the business during that time frame wasn't fun different during those few months. Yeah. So being at home was kind of fun. It's different. We all, we all learned zoom really for the first time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, there was something interesting about it, but I, I think all of that is, has, has worn off and people are desperate to come back. Um, and so I, I certainly think, you know, office is going to be just fine and people are, are going to want to be back in the office. But I do believe, you know, the, the pandemic changed a lot of things and how, how people are going to utilize the office yeah. and even what employee demand will be of their office and of their employer when it comes to the office. You know, I think, you know, this hybrid scenario of people getting more flexibility of where they work and when they work is here to stay. Um, of course, all of us, I mean, we're in kind of now the great resonation. So all of us are trying to figure out new ways of attracting great talent. Mm-hmm. And the strategy that employers roll out around their office is going to be one of the key pillars to obtaining great talent. And I'm not saying that flex office is the ultimate answer to that, yeah. but I do think it's a part. It, it, it's playing a bigger and bigger part of of the right answer there right. because it, it does allow the employees to have more flexibility on where they are working and certainly gives them the amenities and the service that they're looking for to bring them out of their homes into the office. And so you're seeing more and more employer employers seeking that out because they have to, yep. um, you know, but the traditional office is certainly not dead. I think there's a, a, a spot for that. And, you know, I think where landlords get a bit confused when when operators like myself throw out the term flexibility is they think short term. Like flexibility can come in a lot of different ways, right? It just means not to in, in my opinion, not being tied, you know, to the fact that you only have this one 10, 15 year term lease. You know, but I do think employers can get comfortable with a longer term lease. If they've got some other flexible options out there where they can flex in and out of space, whether they're growing or retracting, just based on the fact that you know, business itself is moving a lot faster these days than it was 20 years ago. In your partnership with WeWork, is there anything interesting that comes to mind? And maybe it's still just really early. Obviously, they've learned a lot from how the industry's evolved, maybe some past mistakes that have kind of been, you know, more public, but, um, it's, it looks to me like they're starting to make a lot of smart moves. And and the stat you said early on the flexible workspace going from two to 25% of the office space is enormous. That's, that's 10 X. That's a lot of, of square feet. Um, is there anything that comes to mind about what we work is doing things that are interesting that maybe, you know, every listener here doesn't necessarily, it's not um, obvious, like how things might be changing over the next couple of years or things that they're focused on that you're able to share? Yeah, you know, I know that we've got a new tech stack that's being worked on that's really going to help employers, you know, with how employees are accessing workspaces and that it's going going to go beyond an actual WeWork location, Um, you know, and so I I think you're going to start to see some of the bigger brands out there like WeWork working on these things. And there's already, there's a number of technologies out there, whether it's like a desk pass um, or a liquid space that's been working on these type of things for years. But, you know, I think you're going to see more and more brands become obsessed with saying, Hey, how do we, how do we help, you know, a large enterprise fortune 100, company um with every different part of their workspace solution um and and that's going to be a big part of the formula that's going to be uh, that's going to be part of how we get from two percent to twenty percent of the market being flexible because like i said earlier it's going to be very hard to go build that much square footage over the next 10 years right um which is why i think we've got to work with the occupiers themselves and the landlords on on firing up this product and helping helping arm both occupiers and landlords with both the right tech and the right operations um, to enable flexibility within portfolios does does a common desk only do well in an office setting or 
you know, are there ambitions that y'all would do well as an amenity to like a multifamily project or a condominium project or a big retail center or, or, you know, I mean, go down the list or is it really kind of fit in an office setting? Sure. I mean, I would say that our brand primarily enjoys being more in an office setting, but we do have a few locations that are quasi retail and our very first location that we opened in Deep Ellum, which is just a few blocks east of downtown Dallas is in more of a retail type setting. Mm-hmm. We have a location in, in your hometown, Chris, in Fort Worth that's mm-hmm. in the West 7th District that is on, on the first floor of a multifamily mm-hmm. development and kind of within a, a mixed-use development. And so, you know, those those locations work really well just – being that I have an office background, I think our brand kind of leans towards solving things for office landlords. Um, so it's one of the reasons why we've focused in on that product type. But co-working certainly works really well in retail and, and, and other different uh, other types of product. Yep. I have kind of one more question on the business, and then I want to ask you a couple of questions from your three facts. I thought they were really interesting. Um but it goes back to just leadership during a crisis. When I think of businesses that, that you know, got slapped in the face uh, right out of COVID, uh, one, my heart, and, and I have just an unbelievable amount of respect for the entrepreneurs that, that made it through that were in those industries. Anything you learned maybe about yourself, your team, about business, about life, that kind of coming out of COVID, you know, kind of taught you that, kind of makes you better equipped as you go forward? Yeah, I would say that I learned to lead with a bit more empathy and authenticity. Yeah. You know, and I'm very, I'm very grateful for that. And I think the entrepreneurs that made it through leaned in heavily with their people, you know, and however present you were before 2020, to make it through 2020 and 2021, you probably had the two or three X you know, that, that presence with your staff. Yeah. Um, and we couldn't always do it in person. So we had to find new ways of doing it. Um, that's where I was very thankful for these new technologies like zoom or slack that help you connect with people while everybody's in different areas, different rooms. And, um, you know, and just, uh, I like the, the authenticity part was just to show that, Hey, look, I'm scared. <laughs> you know, like, it's, <laughs> like this is, I don't, yeah, I don't know how we're going to make it through this right now, but I, I'll tell you, I'm going to work my butt off to figure it out. Yep. And, and you know, it, it, it helps to make sure that your employees and the people around you roll up your sleeves. And, and, uh, and I'm just very thankful that at Common Desk, we have a very good leadership team um, that make me look good day in, day out. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> because I would be a huge failure without them. Yep. And it's really, you know, leaning in heavily with, with those type of people to help you lead an organization because it, it, over the last couple of years, it has taken a ton of leadership to make it through these times, yep. um, which that all didn't come from me. There's, you know, thankfully that was throughout the organization. Yep. Well, congrats for making it through and thriving. I've loved every common desk I've walked in. I know we're going to go walk through one in a couple of weeks together, but. Uh, kudos to you, man. If you can make it through that, um, there's probably not a whole lot that they can throw your way at this point. <laughs> knock, knock on wood. Uh, knock yeah, on wood. Like, yeah, don't, don't jinx me, Chris. Yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of things, so let's be careful. But thank you. I appreciate um, it. All right. There's two things, and then then we'll bring it home that I just thought were really interesting. Uh, to people listening, I often will we'll send out to guests kind of three interesting facts and sometimes we talk about them, sometimes we don't, but you had two that kind of stuck out. You said the first one is, I don't believe that lawns should exist. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think about it, in the U.S., okay, okay, lawns, grass, it's it's our largest crop that we can't eat, yep. that we spend our precious resources on just from a vanity perspective of watering and manicuring and we waste time on and just to me it makes no <laughs> sense i think like the the origin of the lawn was like the uh you know the the like royalty in the uk um to where they're kind of showing off 
their wealth and power and and their money. And I'm like, why does why do any of us have one? There's such a waste of time. <laughs> Throw some rocks down and a few Adirondack chairs and call it a day. You know, um, it'll it'll save you a lot of money. And it's actually a lot more fun to turn your front yard into a park like setting. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm heavily against lawns. Now, do you want to plant something that's edible out there and actually, you know, you can feed your family with, that's very different, but, uh, you know, nobody is eating the clippings from their St. Augustine. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting how that became such a thing. I I've never really looked back at <laughs> When did planting a ton of grass in front of your house become such a a staple? Is that an American thing? Do you know, or is that like does everybody have a lawn, or is it just no? Like I said, I think the the origin of it is Europe. It's actually in Europe, but um, Mm. we as Americans just really drove it home, literally, (laughs) (laughs) Um, and became obsessed with them. And so, anyways, I've got. I, I live in a zero lot line neighborhood. Yeah. Um, I mean, mainly I love community, obviously that's kind of what I do and what I obsess over. And so I, I live in a neighborhood that I feel like is really designed to, to bring people together. Yeah. And thankfully they are zero lot lines. So I, I am a, I'm a man with no grass at yeah. the house. <laughs> um, so <laughs> you're, you're living out your, uh, I, I'm living it out. You're living it out. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the last one, and I've actually never been here before, and this has actually been brought up a lot recently because there's one down the street from where I live, and a lot of my friends go, and they love it. Um, I'd love to one day buy Waffle House, the, the chain of restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll unpack this one for you real quick, like. Um, well, one, I come from a restaurant family. My dad owns and operates Chick-fil-A's. And so um, I've admired kind of the Chick-fil-A corporation since I was four years old. And he started it in 1987. Um, and so he has a, a few Chick-fil-A's in the east side of Dallas, and Mesquite, Forney, Sunnyvale area. Um, and so I, I love the restaurant industry. I'm always infatuated with it. But Waffle House, man, Waffle House is a great concept. But here, here's the thing about Waffle House. They've got a very efficient design. Okay. Okay. Um, obviously, it's kind of a diner design. And and they have done a great job of, of staying as a regional chain throughout the southern part of the United States. I think there's well over 2,000 Waffle Houses over there uh, throughout the south. And they... They average about 600K per unit. And I think they've got a market cap of like $3 billion, somewhere in there. Um, but if you ever walk into a Waffle House, you realize that very efficient design. It could be a great product, but it's one of the worst operations I've ever seen in a restaurant in my life. Like it is always going to be dirty, but the food's decent. And there's a little bit of buy in with the employees. Not enough, but a little bit. I just look at it and think, man, the Waffle House is doing 600K a year. You know, your average Chick-fil-A is doing like four to five million dollars a year at this point. Just bring a little bit of that culture magic that Chick-fil-A has. Bring great operations to Waffle House. I swear to God, I think you could I think you could double in place revenue of a, a, you know, the average unit from 600,000 to one, $1.2 million a year. And there's potential to make a few billion dollars off of Waffle House. Um, and my, my grandfather, um, along with my dad used to take me to Waffle House all the time. And now my son and I typically go to Waffle House every Friday morning. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm a weird fan of Waffle House and the fact that I love that we can get in and out of there for about ten dollars, even in 2022. But man, I want to clean it up. It's always a bit grimy, and they call themselves Waffle House, but they need a better waffle. The waffle sucks. I never get the waffle. I get the breakfast sandwich. Um, but there are improvements to be to be had, just like a you know, a, a piece of real estate that's been neglected that Chris and I, you and I would obsess over you know, going in and doing a few capital improvements and getting it released. That's Waffle House. Just needs a 
a few improvements and I think he can improve top line by almost two X and um, could be a nice investment, but uh, I'm going to have to find somebody that'll help me raise $3 billion to go buy it at some point in my life. And obviously right now I'm pretty, pretty busy. <laughs> I don't think this is happening anytime in the next 10 years. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so funny. You say, uh, one, like I, I joke all the time. The American dream is to own a few Chick-fil-A's. It really is the, the best run, um, business ever. And then the, the other part of the funny story is I had a guy on the other day and he said something to the tune of, uh, fast food restaurants or quick service restaurants purpose is to, uh, basically provide what, what did he say, Johnny Dis disappoint you at a, at a rate that you're still willing to accept. And it sounds like common <laughs> desk is doing that for you. They're, they're disappointing you just enough to still keep you coming back uh, or waffle house, waffle house. Um, yeah, correction for the listeners. Yeah, Waffle correct, House. Correction, um, Waffle House. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, Waffle House, I mean, they're doing just enough where I go back every Friday. Yeah. But I'm like, man, just a couple little adjustments. And quite frankly, I'd be totally fine with paying like 25 to 40% more than what they're charging me yeah. if it were just clean and well run. So <laughs> anyways, Waffle House. Um, I'm putting it on record that there's a decent chance that I buy it sometime in my future. If anybody that's an owner of Waffle House is listening to this, there's a buyer in the making. Call Nick. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, awesome. Nick. You've uh you've done a great job. This is awesome. Um I'm 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 bullish on office, I'm bullish on flexible office. Um, and you're clearly leader, leading in the space. So thanks again for sharing today and for coming on the podcast. It means a lot. No, man. Thank you for letting me, let me talk for a little bit. It was a good time. Hey everyone, it's Chris here again. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. If you enjoyed the show, please follow the show on Apple, Spotify, or subscribe on YouTube. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next episode. Chris Powers is the founder and chairman of Fort Capital LP. All opinions from Chris and guests of the Fort Podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Fort Capital LP. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for real estate or investment decisions. The Fort with Chris Powers is produced by Straight Up Podcasts.